What about posterior circulation TIA? Is transient isolated vertigo ever a TIA? Hi there, Peter Johns here, emergency physician and vertigo evangelist. I'm going to review what's known about vertigo presenting as a TIA. In particular, does transient isolated vertigo ever present as a TIA? And what should we do about it? I'll give you my summary, then delve into the topic in more detail. But first, I'll introduce you to Epley. Not the maneuver, the puppy! Here's Eckley. He's a three-month-old Swedish Valhan. He's very cute and he knows everything about BPBV, so if you have any questions, be sure to ask him. With that, we'll move on to TIA in vertigo. There'll be more of Eckley later, but you probably should know that there's no generally agreed upon approach to posterior circulation TIA but there are some guiding principles. First of all, yes, transient isolated vertigo can be a TIA, but it's quite rare, and there are many things that can cause transient isolated vertigo that are way more common, and it's much more common to miss an actual cerebellar stroke than it is to see and then miss a TIA presenting with isolated vertigo. And labeling a patient with transient isolated vertigo as a TIA when they actually have a more benign condition has significant impact on the patient. Unwarranted workup and consultation, treatment with antiplatelet agents, potential impact on employment and insurance. Think of the impact it would have on you if you were diagnosed with a mini stroke when all you had was BPBV and all you needed was an Epley maneuver to cure you of your episodes of transient isolated vertigo. So here's my suggested stepwise approach. If the patient has other neurologic signs or symptoms, then that is non-isolated vertigo and they need workup for TIA. If they happen to still be having ongoing continuous vertigo and nystagmus, then they're the right patient to do the HINTS Plus exam on to determine if they're having vestibular neuritis, more likely, or a tricky little cerebellar stroke masquerading as vestibular neuritis, less likely. If they have no other neurologic symptoms and the vertigo has resolved in minutes to less than 24 hours, that is truly transient isolated vertigo, then look for TIA mimics, mainly BPBV and vestibular migraine. If no TIA mimic fits and they're at high risk for stroke, then treat them like they're having a TIA. If they don't have another clear diagnosis but are not at high risk for stroke, you should provide care consistent with their local standards of care, which could be doing an MRIA or doing nothing. This is where there is no generally agreed upon approach to vertigo presenting as TIA. Okay, now that you know the answer, here's the background and a review of most of the literature about TIA and vertigo. A couple of years ago, I asked David Newman Toker, neuroatologist at Johns Hopkins and one of the authors of the original HINTS study, how do you rule out a TIA in a patient with transient isolated vertigo? His answer in part was, nobody knows what to do with them. What he meant by this is that there's no generally agreed upon approach to posterior circulation TIA, and your approach may depend on where you practice, because of variation in medical legal concerns, that is more concerns in the U.S., less elsewhere perhaps, like in Canada, as well as the availability of local resources for diagnostic imaging and specialist referral. So I wouldn't exactly be surprised if you showed up with an episode of transient isolated vertigo at Johns Hopkins, that you might get more of a workup than if you show up at the hospital at Smooth Rock Falls. Let's define what I mean by TIA presenting as transient isolated vertigo. That's where a patient has one or more episodes of dizziness vertigo with no other neurologic symptoms, and it resolves completely in a few minutes in less than 24 hours, and then later, often in a couple of days, suffers a posterior circulation stroke. I've already given you the short answer that it does exist and that it's quite rare, and there's no generally agreed upon approach for workup. One aggressive approach for workup is suggested by Sabra Tarani, who along with other esteemed co-authors, David Newman Toker, Kata, Kerber, Z, Gold, suggested that unless the patient with transient vertigo clearly has BPBV, every patient should be getting an MRI, MRA. This, even though they write in the body of the paper that routine MRIs are untenable and unrealistic. Another extreme approach would be not investigate any patient with isolated transient dizziness vertigo. That seems a little cavalier. Is there a reasonable middle ground approach? Now we'll go through my suggested stepwise approach in more detail. First of all, with any patient with vertigo dizziness, 
you need to ask about the usual posterior circulation ischemia symptoms, such as face or limb weakness, paresthesias, dysarthria, diplopia, unable to walk unaided, new significant sustained headache or neck pain, because if they have any of those, that is now non-isolated vertigo, and these patients need further workup for stroke or TIA. If you Google CMAJ, Vertigo, and my last name Johns, you'll find the open access article. It's also in Tintinelli's Emergency Medicine textbook in the 9th edition. You can see the words, or were, present in my algorithm, put there to capture the transient, non-isolated vertigo patients I just described who are potentially having a TIA. Next, if it's not transient vertigo, but instead they have persistent dizziness vertigo symptoms and nystagmus, either spontaneous or a gaze evoked at the time you see them, then this is acute vestibular syndrome and you can apply HINTS or HINTS Plus to see if it's likely vestibular neuritis, more commonly, versus cerebellar stroke, less common. This slide shows, shows up on the right-hand side of the algorithm. But if it's truly transient isolated vertigo, then we should next look to see if the patient has one of the common causes of transient isolated vertigo, which can be confused for posterior circulation TIAs that is a TIA mimic, and they are most commonly migraine, BPPV, syncope, and orthostatic hypotension. It should be fairly easy to differentiate syncope and orthostatic hypotension from a posterior circulation TIA by a good history and physical, so I won't talk about that any further. BPPV is transient isolated vertigo, but the difference is that it's triggered, initiated by head movements such as getting in or out of bed or rolling over in bed. If you don't ask the patient about this, you might misdiagnose BPBV, which is very common, as a TIA, which is rare. Also, the, pa the patient may unintentionally mislead you by saying that their dizzy episode was 10 minutes, when in fact they were only intensely vertiginous for 30 seconds when they got out of bed, but they felt nauseated and sweaty for another 10 minutes or so afterwards. Here's an example of a patient who was diagnosed with a TIA when they were actually having a TIA mimic. She had already been in CT, getting a CT angiogram, and had a referral for a TIA minor stroke clinic referral filled out, as well as a prescription for ASA, and her driver's license was going to be revoked. When I came on at the change of shift, I was asked to simply follow up on the imaging report and then send her home if it was normal with referral to the TIA clinic. After the normal CTA was reported, I went to talk to her, and it was clear that her brief episodes of vertigo were brought on by position change. So I did, I did a Dix-Hallpike test, and this is what I saw. A typical positive Dix-Hallpike test. After one Epley maneuver, the repeat Dix-Hallpike test was normal, with no nystagmus or vertigo. So she was discharged without ASA or the TIA clinic referral, and she kept her driver's license. So ask carefully if position change brings on the attacks and how long the intense dizziness lasts for. And if their vertigo is resolved and they have no spontaneous nystagmus, do a dix hall pike test and a supine roll test to look for BPBV, both posterior canal and horizontal canal. What about migraine? Can it cause transient isolated vertigo? Well, yeah. In fact, it's the most common cause of episodic non-triggered vertigo, but it's often not diagnosed by frontline providers. And almost half the episodes of dizziness vertigo in vestibular migraine can be transient isolated vertigo with no headache or other migraine symptoms. Watch my video to learn more about how to diagnose vestibular migraine, this very common posterior circulation TIA mimic. So if you've ruled out these TIA mimics, what to do next? Look at their risk factors for stroke. Very high risk patients for stroke will likely require imaging and antiplatelet therapy. But what to do with the non-high risk patients? Again, that's where there's no consensus and the answer will be different in different medical communities. At my teaching hospital, Emergency physicians can't get an MRI, MRA for a patient with transient isolated vertigo. In other areas, it may be routine. So another quick recap on the approach to transient vertigo. If neurologic signs are present, work them up for TIA. If ongoing vertigo and nystagmus, apply HINTS Plus exam. Look for TIA mimics. If not found, look at the risk factors for stroke. High-risk patients get treated like a TIA, and non-high-risk patients get treated as per your local standard of care. But what evidence is there about how common posterior circulation TIAs occur and how it presents? And why do some people suggest that posterior circulation TIAs commonly have transient isolated vertigo, and others suggest, including myself, that it's fairly rare? 
Strap on your medical literature safety belts. We're going deep. Let's start by talking about the differences between anterior and posterior TIA. In typical anterior circulation TIA, the patient has a clumsy or weak arm and or leg or facial droop on one side, perhaps some paresthesias on one side of the body, and maybe some difficulty finding words, which then resolves. It's not an experience that most people will ever have, and the people that do often recognize it as something significant and seek medical attention. Frontline providers also often recognize these symptoms as a possible TIA, because there aren't a lot of other things that will cause you to have these kind of symptoms. Posterior circulation TIA can have some of the typical limb or face weakness or paresthesias, as well as vertigo, difficulty with balance, dysarthria, diplopia. Transient isolated vertigo is a fairly common phenomena and many people have it experienced in, in their lives. Not everyone comes to the emergency department with it, but enough to make transient isolated vertigo a very common presentation to the ED. It's most often caused by PPBV or vestibular migraine or orthostatic hypotension, but rarely it can be a posterior circulation TIA. So the problem is that signal versus noise ratio. Posterior circulation TIA is the rare signal we're looking for, but there's a lot of noise that can cause transient isolated vertigo. So let's start the literature deep dive by looking first at a study of undifferentiated patients presenting to the ED with vertigo dizziness and how many were diagnosed with TIA. NAVI's review of 907 patients presenting to the emergency department with dizziness over a three-year period identified eight patients with TIA, but only one patient presented with a TIA with isolated vertigo. That's 0.1%, pretty rare. In Kerber's retrospective study of patients presenting to the ED with dizziness, vertigo, or imbalance, nine out of 1,297 patients with isolated vertigo were diagnosed with either a stroke or TIA, which is roughly 0.7%. Exactly how many of these were strokes versus TIA was, was not stated, but since roughly a third of the total number of patients with stroke or TIA were TIAs, the number was probably closer to a quarter of a percent of isolated transient vertigo was diagnosed with a TIA, not far off from the number by NAVI. Now let's look at two studies where patients suspected of having a TIA were referred to a TIA clinic. The first one is from my shop, the University of Ottawa, by Jeff Perry and Ian Steele et al. This prospective study looked at 3,906 patients with newly suspected TIAs, of which 2.2% had a stroke in the next seven days. Isolated vertigo had an odds ratio of only 0.3. They concluded that patients with transient isolated vertigo were less concerning for stroke. In a paper by Nadarajan of 1,532 patients referred to a TIA clinic, they found that 22% had a diagnosis that wasn't a TIA. When they looked at the TIA mimics, over half were migraine. If you look at the TIA mimics they identified that commonly present with transient isolated dizziness vertigo, that is migraine, syncope, vestibular problems, and post postural hypotension, the percentage climbs to over 70% of TIA mimics they found could be presenting with dizziness vertigo. They suggested that in isolated vertigo, you should be looking at other diagnoses before labeling it as a TIA, which is what I suggested in my approach. They also stated that isolated dizziness was more likely to be due to a vestibular disorder than a TIA. So we found that of dizzy patients coming to the emergency department, a very small number, 0.1 to 0.25% of patients with transient isolated dizziness might be having a TIA. Then we found that with patients with isolated vertigo who were suspected of having a TIA, were in fact having a low risk for a stroke compared to other typical TIA symptoms, and that the most common TIA mimic is migraine. So is transient isolated vertigo a common presenting symptom for impending stroke? Jonathan Edlow is an emergency physician and excellent vertigo teacher who has published widely on vertigo for years. And I agree with 99% of what he says about vertigo. But we do seem to have a different take on TIA in vertigo. In a recent article, he states that although posterior circulation TIA presenting as a isolated dizziness was long thought to not exist, mounting evidence demonstrates that it does. He also states that newer studies make, a clear, make it clear that isolated dizziness is the most common transient symptom that precedes posterior circulation stroke and occurs in approximately 8% of these patients. He gives five references for the statement on the left. Let's have a look at those references. Two of the references can be dismissed fairly quickly. Gulli 
looked at 359 patients with posterior circulation TIA or stroke, and they looked at the risk of stroke recurrence in relation to stenoses found on diagnostic imaging. There is absolutely no description of the symptoms reported by the patients in this study, so it provides nothing to support the contention that there is mounting evidence that isolated dizziness can present as a TIA. Another non-relevant reference was PLAS, as this study looked at 1,265 patients with minor stroke or TA, and every single one of these patients had focal neurologic deficits. So again, it tells you nothing about transient isolated dizziness as a presentation of TIA because none of them had transient isolated dizziness. Now we'll look at Paul, a study that does tell us something about TIA presenting as isolated vertigo. This study has been used as evidence that isolated vertigo is a concerning sign for a TIA before a posterior circulation stroke. In fact, this is where Edlow got his 8% of patients have isolated vertigo before the strokes from. And also where Saber Tarani got his inspiration for stating that over 50% of posterior circulation TIAs present with isolated vertigo. Are those statements really true? As is often the case, the devil is in the details. Paul's study was published in Lancet Neurology in 2013. The population was in the UK, where they have universal access to health care. In this study, they also had an open access TIA service available seven days a week. They identified all strokes, both anterior and posterior, and obtained a history of symptoms and events up to 90 days preceding the stroke via a questionnaire the patient answered after they presented with their stroke. They had 1,141 stroke patients, of which 275 were posterior circulation strokes. They identified 45 patients that had reported what they termed a TNA, transient neurological attack, preceding their stroke, which could have been isolated vertigo, or vertigo with other symptoms, or isolated double vision, or other visual symptoms. In fact, 23 out of the 45 patients who reported having a TNA, that's 51%, said it was isolated vertigo. And that means 23 out of the 275 patients, 8.3%, reported having isolated vertigo before their stroke. So this is where Saber Tarani and Edlo get their numbers from. So if you read the statements by Saber Tarani and Edlo, and you take them as facts, you might think that many patients who are going to have a posterior circulation stroke are coming to the emergency department with transient isolated vertigo, and we have lots of opportunity to diagnose them and treat them. But, and this is copied right out of the abstract, in fact, only 10 of the 45 patients, 22%, who reported that they had a TNA before their posterior circulation stroke actually sought medical attention for their TNA before their stroke, which means 78% did not which means that of the 275 patients who suffered a posterior circulation stroke, only 10, 3.6%, sought medical attention for some kind of TNA before their stroke. Obviously, this means that 96% of patients did not seek medical attention. And remember, this was in a universal healthcare system with a seven-day-a-week open-access TIA clinic. Plus, the study doesn't state how many of the 10 patients actually had isolated vertigo. Since roughly half the patients with TNAs in this study had isolated vertigo, we could postulate that perhaps only 5 out of the 275, or 1.8% of patients with a posterior circulation stroke, had a transient isolated vertigo attack before their stroke that was concerning enough that they sought medical attention for it. So I would disagree with Saber Tarani's take on this study, which was that over 50% of patients presented with isolated vertigo, since almost 80% of these patients never saw a doctor for their symptoms. Also, I don't see this as mounting evidence that an isolated dizziness episode is a concerning finding for impending stroke. And having 8% of patients report having an isolated dizziness episode preceding their stroke doesn't mean much when less than 2% actually saw a doctor about it. Remember that presenting symptom or complaint is what makes the patient present, that is, actually see or talk to a doctor. It's not something that, after they have a stroke, they recall having a funny episode a day or two before their stroke. The only way to intervene on the other almost 80% of patients who had a TNA but didn't go to the doctor with their TNA is to throw them into a time machine and take them back a few days. Or more feasibly, educate the public that dizziness can be a TIA or stroke symptom. But we already do that. It's in the American and British Stroke Association's patient information about the symptoms of stroke. So not sure how we're going to reach these patients who don't seek medical attention for their possible posterior circulation TIA. Just two more references to go through. 
Ashino study is very similar to Paul's study, except it's missing important information. One neurologist interviewed 214 patients with acute posterior circulation stroke. They were asked about preceding symptoms and whether they consulted a doctor about those symptoms. He found that indeed 9 out of 214, 4.2%, stated they had an isolated vertigo episode before the stroke, but he didn't report the number of how many sought medical attention for them. I emailed the author to ask about this, but the email address listed on the study bounced back as undeliverable. So it's unclear how many of these patients sought medical attention for transient isolated vertigo. But if it's like Paul's study, it would be about 1 in 5, which means that it's likely the number of patients who had a cerebellar stroke and who consulted a doctor about the symptoms is less than 1%. The last reference provided by Edlow to support his contention that there is mounting evidence that isolated vertigo is a concerning symptom for posterior circulation TIA is a study by Lavallee of 2,398 patients with suspected TIA in France. These patients were broken down into typical TIA symptoms such as motor deficit, aphasia, and and homonymous hemianopsia, and transient monocular blindness, and also atypical symptoms which included vertigo and unsteadiness which they reported combined, partial sensory deficits, dysarthria, and unusual visual deficits. They found only 1.2% of all suspected TIAs had isolated vertigo or unsteadiness. Looking at the supplemental data, you can see that when they performed diffusion-weighted MRI on all these patients, those with isolated vertigo and steadiness had ischemia on their imaging only 1.4% of the time, while those with isolated motor weakness or dysarthria were 14 to 16 times more likely to have ischemia on their MRIs. Also, 61% of the suspected TIAs with isolated vertigo and steadiness turned out to have an alternate diagnosis while only 5-10% to of those isolated motor or dysarthria had an alternate diagnosis. Not surprisingly, migraine was the most common stroke mimic in this study. So to summarize all the papers we've looked at so far, Navi showed of patients going to the emergency department with dizziness, only 0.1% had a TIA with isolated dizziness. Kerber showed that probably 0.25% of isolated dizziness had a TIA. Perry showed that transient isolated vertigo is less concerning for stroke or TIA. Nadarajan showed that over 70% of TIA mimics are conditions that commonly cause isolated dizziness, that is migraine, syncope, BPBV, and other vestibular disorders and orthostatic hypotension. And of the five studies that Edlow referenced claiming that they contained mounting evidence isolated vertigo causing a TIA exists, and that 8% of patients with posterior circulation TIA have isolated vertigo preceding their stroke, the first two were irrelevant as Gulli didn't describe the symptoms, and PLAS patients all had focal neurological symptoms to begin with, and Hoshino didn't give the answer of how many patients sought medical attention for their isolated vertigo TIA. Paul's study suggested that less than 2% of patients with posterior circulation strokes seek medical attention for an episode of isolated vertigo before their stroke. And Lavallee showed that of patients suspected of having a TIA, only 1.2% had isolated vertigo, and of those, 61% were diagnosed with a stroke mimic and not a TIA. He also showed that isolated vertigo is a much less concerning symptom in terms of a possible TIA than, say, motor weakness or dysarthria. So that is all the evidence I could find for those who suggest we worry about transient isolated vertigo being a TIA. Maybe it's one of those glass half full, glass half empty things, but my bottom line is that transient isolated vertigo is rarely a TIA and you should be first thinking about TIA mimics and then think about TIA mimics again and only then move on to consider if it could actually be a TIA. A view more in line with mine can be seen in a paper by Welcome Pola and Michael Hamalgi et al. Hamalgi is one of the authors of the original description of the head impulse test in 1988 and a mentor of David Newman Toker. In the paper Dizziness Demystified, these authors state that vertebrobasilar ischemia rarely causes isolated vertigo. In another paper by Hamalgi, he stated that transient vertebrobasilar ischemia is a difficult clinical diagnosis at any time, but it's very unlikely to be correct in a patient that has only attacks consisting only of vertigo. One last paper to put things in perspective. This paper by Arch, and there's been others with similar results, showed that posterior circulation stroke was misdiagnosed 37% of the time. 
and posterior circulation stroke is seen much more commonly than posterior circulation TIA. Remember that in Paul's study, 96% of the patients who had a posterior circulation stroke did not seek medical attention before their stroke. And if it's only 1.8% of patients who have isolated vertical before their stroke, where should we be concentrating our educational and diagnostic imaging resources? I would argue that we need to be able to recognize the dizzy stroke who is sitting or lying in front of us and not worry so much about the rare patient who is having an isolated episode of vertigo that ends up being a TIA. But again, I'm not writing off transient isolated vertigo. My suggestion again is to use this stepwise approach to minimize missing this rare phenomena. By ensuring that you are limiting diagnostic imaging to patients who have other neurologic signs or those with constant vertigo and nystagmus who test hints plus central or who have transient isolated vertigo with high risk factors for stroke and also by ruling out common TIA mimics, this will be far more rewarding than imaging every low risk patient with transient isolated vertigo. Don't forget about the significant impact that making an erroneous diagnosis of TIA can have on a patient. So once again, evaluating the dizzy patient is about doing the right bedside test or right diagnostic test on the right patient. And as I said in a recent tweet, thinking that the MRI is the answer to diagnosing all vertigo patients is like thinking the answer to world hunger is Uber Eats. That's it for TIA and vertigo. If you want to learn more about TIA mimics such as BPPV and vestibular migraine, click on the videos on your screen. Thanks for watching, and Epley thanks you for watching too.